Let's pray. Father God, I do thank you, Lord, today. What a privilege to be in your house. Lord, I, I just thank you. Lord, I need you this morning. I need, need your help that we may understand what's going on with this. And Lord, I just give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. I have been receiving this warning from the Lord, and uh, I need to share it. If you don't apply what we've been doing the last few weeks, you will become hard of heart and dull of hearing. Hard of heart and dull of hearing. You know, like that. So we know which ones so far have gotten in. Okay. But this is a, this is a reality. Um, I remember when I asked you guys if I could have permission to teach this series. There's a reason. And the reason is because I heard at the beginning very, very, that this was going to be something that was going to be touching individual lives in a way that was going to radically change them. But if you don't apply this, you know what you get to do? You get to strengthen the hold of fear in your life. I'm not trying to be nasty or mean, but what I am trying to get at is the fact that the reason God gave us this series and the reason God is doing this thing is because there's going to be need coming up soon for us to understand it. Okay? We will need it. The Bible says in the last days men's hearts will fail them because of fear. And listen, folks, we're coming up on some times that's going to be very fearful on everybody but us. Well, it'll be on anybody who at this point doesn't apply what we have going. Why? If we don't get this, we cause damage in our own lives. I'm, I don't want you to get this idea that, okay, we just come to church, we get all this teaching and stuff, and we have a lot of fun, and, which is true. But understand, understand this. God has given us these words. This is unique. This is... This is different than what most churches are hearing. Do you understand? Of course, that's true with a lot of stuff we do, but there's a reason why. And that is, if we don't practically apply these things, we are toast. We are really in trouble. And I am personally having to apply them in ways I never expected. I never expected the fears to show up that have shown up in my life. I have not expected them. They are like, really? You're kidding. There's another one. Are you... I mean, just, it's just like, what a revelation for me, is I am learning more and more and more about the fears that govern me, and it's scaring me. Pun not intended, but still there. And it is amazing to me how many fears I've found in my own life. And I'm just like, well, what else? Okay? What else? It's just, it's, it is amazing to me, but we've got to deal with this. Now, while I'm at that point, um, Money. Let's talk about money for just a second. If we don't have enough offering, we can't pay the mortgage this week. You say, well, shouldn't you have said that before? Well, not everybody was here before offering. Okay? That's our problem is people don't show up until after the offering is taken. Okay? Do the people who show up after the offering taken still put enough money in the offering? I'm sure hoping you do. Okay, but here's the deal. We should take up another one after this. I need you to really hear from God on this. If we're getting complacent to the point where we're just giving indiscriminately, just whatever, you know, throw in your 20 and do your thing. Folks, if we've got to understand. We've got to hear from God. God is our source. God will bless us through you. If you are not willing to be the blessing, he can't bless you. You've got to understand that. What is the fear? The fear is if I give what the Lord is telling me to give, I won't have enough. And so what does it do? Well, very simple. Fear keeps us from doing what we need to do. Now, you know who's the worst at this? Males, guys, men. They're the worst at this money thing. When it comes to money on giving like this, guys are really, really have a problem. It's, when you go to conferences, you know who pays for conferences? Women. It's the offering. When they give up the offering, it's the women who write out the checks. And they give. It's the women who buy books and tapes and CDs. Not tapes, probably not anymore, but books and CDs. And DVDs and MP3s and whatever else they are out there, okay? Somebody asked me at this last conference if we're going to have our conference in Blu-ray. I said, no. They asked that? They actually asked that. So I said, no. 
I says, do you really want this face in high definition? But fear keeps us from doing. Men have a real hard time with this. And men will give $20 in an offering and say, wow, I got a whole seminar for 20 bucks. And consider it a good deal. They won't hear from God. I'll tell you, we get into this fear thing. If I give my money at church, I won't have my money to play with for the things I want to buy. Okay? So, folks, we've got to get our priorities straight on this. But we need to know. I'm not into fear about this. I've had to really fight about this. I had to just say, okay, it's God's thing. But we need to stress to you that this week, the mortgage is due. We have been caught up on our mortgage for months. It's been really cool how, how the money's coming in. I just got to let you know. We got to keep the lights on. We got to keep things happening here. Okay, ask the Lord what you should be giving. You say, why tithe? Anybody hear this thing that I've been teaching about how in the Old Testament it was the external and the New Testament's on the internal? And how God, when he brought it to the internal, he exponentially blew up everything? In the Old Testament, it was 10%. And you're going, uh, oh no, I know where this is heading. <laughs> this doesn't sound good. In the Old Testament, it was you couldn't commit adultery. In the New Testament, you couldn't even think about it. In the New Old Testament, you couldn't murder anybody. In the New Testament, you couldn't even get angry. In the Old Testament, it's the tithe. In the New Testament, it's everything is his. It's not just 10%, folks. It's all his. And if he says, give 50% of your paycheck, you know what you should be doing? Giving 50% of your paycheck. And you say, why? No, I've already, I've just finally adjusted to the 10. That's law, folks. Let's get this on the internal. What does God want to do? Exponentially bless you higher than your 10%. Wasn't that fun? Fear says, <laughs> fear says that we can't serve God the way we should. Fear says we can't serve him. Fear says that we are to ruin our relationships. Fear says it's more important what I'm feeling right now and I'll destroy somebody else. Fear will hurt somebody else. Fear always ruins relationships. Fear hurts our spirituality. It tears us up. We are commanded not to fear. Not that that seems to affect any of us. I did a dumb thing once. Once? Only once. <laughs> yeah, that was passing from a lot of people. <laughs> you don't even... It was in stereo, you guys. You two are in trouble. Okay. <laughs> I did a dumb thing in the fact that I... I realized the Lord said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I went, I don't even know what the commands are. So I started in Matthew, and I wrote down every command. I just started reading, and I wrote down every command I found. I got to about, oh, chapter 6, and I was destroyed. I mean, it took only just the, I, I was pretty cocky up until about 5, and then I got still going, and I went to 6, and I stopped. And the Lord says, what are you doing? Uh, he says, I didn't tell you to stop. Ooh, so I went through all of Matthew and wrote down every single command. I was so convicted by the time I got done, I was completely chewed up. And the Lord said, what you stopping for? I didn't tell you to stop. I went, the Gospels? I didn't tell you to stop. <gasps> the whole New Testament? Yeah, get after it. it took me three months. You want to know something? Every time I get to feel a little cocky about myself, I remember that little study. <laughs> Takes care of it right there. We don't want to look at fear. It scares us. That's a, that's a fact. We are afraid that we do have fear to deal with. And it's just kind of a double-edged sword. This thing keeps going. I'm afraid of fear, and fear scares me, so I'm not going to look at fear to deal with the fear because the fear scares me because I do know that I have fear. Oh, man, this thing starts twisting it. Here's the deal. There's not a single person in this room who doesn't have fear to deal with. Every single one of us. And I mean, it's really a tough thing to tell guys, you have fear. Oh, I'm not afraid of anything. You're afraid right there to admit you have fear. So the fear is kind of an obvious. It just gets crazy. But we have been given many weapons to deal with, to give us to us to use in this thing. Last week, we hit a big one. There is no fear in love. Did you love that set this morning? What did it talk about? Bore you, did it? <laughs> what did it talk about? Almost every song in there talked about love. 
love, the love, it just it came right out of this message. It's just perfectly right on the money. There is no fear in love. Therefore, any area where I have fear is an area where I do not know his love. Any area where I have fear is an area where I have no understanding or application of his love. If I'm afraid of the weather, I don't believe he loves me enough to affect the weather. And yet, what did he say? Peace be still and calm to storm. Will he take care of us? Can he protect us? Yes. But why don't we believe in his protection? Because in that area, we do not believe he loves us in the area of protection. We could even do the same thing in the area of finances. For years and years and years, I knew that God loved me in certain areas, but I never could figure out that he loved me financially. It's been tough. It's been tough. Do we know he loves us? No. No. Not at all. When are we going to get it? Are we going to apply his love? Are we going to apply how to hear from him his love for us in these areas? Do we know he loves us? We receive judgment easily, quickly, and just <laughs> with all, all sincerity, we receive judgment easy. But we don't receive love easy. And you can prove this just sitting here talking to somebody. You walk up to somebody and say, you know, you know, you're not dressed exactly the way you should do it. Like it's, and immediately we go, well, what's wrong? And we're thinking about it. But to walk up to somebody and say, do you know that God loves you? We trip off right there. We're brought up in judgment. And we're brought up in receiving judgment. That's been our, our whole life. Oh, boy, do we believe in judgment. Judgment, we believe. But love, we don't believe. It's kind of fascinating. We have performance-based acceptance. Okay, we learned this last week. Performance-based acceptance. We accept people by their performance, and we expect to be accepted by our performance. But we know that our performance isn't good enough. So we're hoping people don't notice and still accept us. And it says that fear, we took this right out of 1 John. Remember what we talked about in 1 John chapter 4 last week. The whole thing came down to fear has punishment. Why does that bother us? Because we know we do deserve it. Heavy duty, heavy duty. But then we found out something, that God is love. You know that whole thing that we talk about when you look at your wife deeply in her little eyes and you bat your eyes at her, bat your eyes like this? Okay, what do you say to her? Oh, honey, I love you. Really? Have you examined it? Are you talking about that warm, fuzzy feeling? Or are you talking about God is love, that the God of the universe is driving right through you to her to love her through you? Have we figured out that it's deeper than our culture and what our understanding and our literature has told us what love is? And how many guys have said, oh, baby, if you'll love me. Yeah, finish the sentence. We learned last week that there's abiding in every way, and we're going to hit it again this week, okay? The abiding in Him. In Him is love. To abide in God is to abide in love, and love abides in you. We're still, actually, still teaching the first series we started with in January. Abiding. We're still abiding. Is that this year or was that last year? That was last year. Uh, we're still in the abiding series. <laughs> We talked last week about being perfected in love. A person who has been perfected in love is loved. Being perfected. And that means having that perfect love, that love that is the end result love, the God who is love, change us to become like him. To have our lives being changed by his love. The love is the absolute, absolute biggest thing. Faith, love, presence, all of those are just relationship. They're just relationship. Okay, fighting fear. What have we learned so far? Oh, a bunch of stuff. Fear of death is the power of the enemy. We found out in Hebrews that the enemy has the, the power of death. And how does he use this power of death? It says, and by fear of death kept people in slavery. And it's the fear of death that we are still dealing with. What are you afraid to die? Oh, and that's a big deal. Now, just... Yesterday, I was working hard and heavy on the new face-to-face -face training that we're coming up with, and I've developed a whole session on dealing with just fear. Okay, how to teach people how to help others deal with fear. Fear of death is, the big, is a major cause of that. 
What's the weapon against fighting that? Well, just go ahead and die. If you're dead, you don't have fear of death. Dead people are not afraid of dying. They're already dead. It says that in that he died, he dies no more. In that he lives, he lives to God. Well, that should be our whole understanding. Is if we die to ourselves, we're dead. Death no longer holds it over us. In that we live, we live to God. That's the whole idea behind it. That's what we've been talking about. And then we have to remember that his presence is with us continually. Um, practicing the presence of God. Practicing his presence. I've been doing that. I've been trying to remember. He's with me right now. He's with me right now. Right in the middle of things that are not going the way they should. He's with me right now. But if we, Right in the middle of all this turmoil, what's happening? Is he with me? Is he with me? I've got to remember his presence. I've got to trust him, not ourselves. This is what we talked about, about the thing of faith. What fights? Now, these are the different things we found to fight faith with so far. The first was the fear of death. How do you fight it? You go ahead and die. The second was, was um, how do we fight fear? With his presence. Remember when he shows up, when the big, big brother shows up, the bully runs away? You know, we like and we get all cocky in his presence. You know, that's right. And faith, faith, trust. Faith, trust, and believe. The same word in the Greek. Trust him and not yourself. That's important. Grace is God's love in action. Grace is that God is doing it because... Because. God does not need a reason to love you. He loves you because. Now, I've got three kids. They're all sitting in this line, right? This row right here. Jeremiah's kind of thrown in the middle there, but we're going to just discount him for right now. Okay? <laughs> Throw this all out. Okay. I don't need a reason to love these guys. Now, there are sometimes I have to remember that I love them. But... <laughs> I, I love these guys. I love them. I don't have to have a reason. I can't work up, hmm, loving them. I love them because I love them. Now, I have to make sure we deal with judgments. We have to make sure that our relationships together are done right. And the times when we start thinking of relationships outside of Christ, then people get angry and there's animosities. And we have to deal with those things to make sure there's... But, uh, but that's just reality of just living. But really... Grace is here. I love them just because they're who they are. Now, there's Kimberly and there's Brittany. I'm, I know that this sounds so totally bigoted at this point, but I don't love Brittany the way I love Kimberly. I'm sorry. Not really. Not really sorry. I don't know. I just, it just happened. Is she not worthy? It has nothing to do with it. You understand? It's by relationship. Well, that's the way God is with us. He loves us just because. How do you explain grace? Grace is so huge. Okay, and we throw it out there. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And most people go, just they sing a song. Do you know his grace? What does it mean? He loves you with all of who he is just because. And you can't earn it. Wow. We know his love to know his love for you in its depth is the, is the most important part, is to know how much he loves you. That's, that's really huge. Now, examining our walk. Let's go on a little bit, okay? We now have seen these different tools, these different things that, that um, have been used, that God brought us in the scriptures. Well, let's talk about this one. Busy, busy, busy. Does this relate to anybody's life? <laughs> The quote is that Satan said, if I can't make them sin, I'll just keep them busy. Both of them will keep you out of God's presence. I can't make them sin, I'll just keep them busy. Busy, 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 busy. And man, there is a draw on us to, boy, just this has to be done, 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 this has to be done. <laughs> I, I, my wife scheduled me to go writing. I got a hotel room for me this week, put me down in the tech center, and there I sat and wrote. And I got so much done, it was amazing. But this morning, I, I come in, and Greg and I are in the sound booth, and Greg says, well, did you get your writing done? 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 That's a mythical beast. That's right there with griffins and unicorns and mermaids. There's no such real item as being done with writing. <laughs> There's, I, got, I got schedules out there. I got things. And it weighs on me when I don't get time to write. 
and it pulls at me, and it pulls at me. And people, you know, are waiting for this to be done. I have published two books. Both of them are obsolete right now. I've learned so much since I published those that they're, they're incomplete. They're not bad. There's nothing in them wrong. It's just it is not enough. It's not, well, what happens? Well, our revelation is growing, okay? I've got these things going. What do I have to do? Well, I look at it, and it starts to fill in my being a turmoil, just a stress. You know what that is? That's fear that I'll never get it done. Fear that it won't be right. Fear that I'm not going to be able to hand it to somebody. Fear. And it's just, it's just fear. I'm just going, wow, never saw it. Every stress in your life is a fear. Stress is a fear. There's a fear involved in it. A fear that you're not going to get it done. The fear that you're not going to do it right. A fear that somebody's going to find out you're a fraud. That you're not as good as they're paying you to be. And there's all these other fears. There's all these fears. That's where stress comes from. Fear that I'm not going to get my point across. And nobody's going to listen to me. Fear they're not going to value me. Fear you, boy. There's a lot of thousands of fears, aren't they? And what everyone calls is stress. Stress, stress, stress. There's demands made on our time and our money. Everything that happens costs. Anybody else relate to that one? Right now I have an enemy. A real bad news enemy. It's called the check engine light in my Jeep. It came on and on and on and on and on. We finally took it to several people and they put in a, oh, all the work that's been done. Finally, it still came on and on and on. Took it over to Grand Automotive and they finally found it. They found all the stuff. It cost us. The yeah, that's about it. <laughs> I thought about that, you know. Remember that 38 special you were talking about? <laughs> but uh, they finally found it. Two weeks after we got it back from them, Kimberly's driving it, and it stutters, and the check engine light comes on. What does it make you feel like? You, you've been there. You understand the stress of it. Why? You know that that light coming on is going to cost you money. It's going to cost you, isn't it? Boom. We found out that it was all Kimberly. Kimberly caused it. No, she didn't. I just like <laughs> I, we took it. I called the guy over Grant. And he, uh, he had a brain in, and he was so upset because, I mean, they'd never seen anything so hard to diagnose as that check engine light. So I took it back over there, and he called me, and he was so excited. He said, I'm so excited. It's not the engine. It's your transmission. <laughs> and he says, I know that sounds wrong, but it's not the engine. You know? Yeah. So it cost us another 750 bucks this week to get our transmission dealt with. It's no, it's a vehicle thing. <laughs> and I know how much you spend on every vehicle you've owned, buddy, so you don't even go there. So. They're all made by Jesus, a conspiracy. <laughs> it's a conspiracy. <laughs> how about this one is a stress? We are responsible for what we don't know. How many of you know all your tax deductions other than Mike? <laughs> know all the ones you need to have. Oh, but see, it's responsible. We're responsible to know them. Isn't it kind of fascinating? There's all sorts of different things. Well, they'll, they'll take your money. I mean, a jail is a, an eventuality down the road. <laughs> a lot of bad things have to happen before then. But, but it still comes to the point where, okay, you ever heard that ignorance is no excuse? Yeah, and it isn't. You're supposed to know this stuff. Boy, I would like to be in the medical field medical field, you have to know and stay current on everything that's happening. And all it takes is somebody saying, you're not current. I'm going to sue you. Oh, stress. Talk about stress. You're responsible for things you don't know. Anybody relate to this? If you Make don't do something, if you do something you're not supposed to do, there could be a penalty. If you don't do something you're supposed to do, you won't get the blessing. Right. So either way, you're hung if you do, hung if you don't, kind of a deal, okay? But you've got to do, okay, this is why we've got to understand his presence. Unknown forces out of our control, that just drives people nuts, okay? Things that you can't do anything about that are affecting your life. Anybody here relate to that? Yeah. <laughs> right crowd came again, all right. We, we even worry about what might happen. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> How about this one? Not enough insurance to cover everything. Okay, there's no way to know. Okay, now they're talking about calamity insurance. We're talking about that with Miranda about, about you know, what happens if this, you know, but why? Here's, here's probably the worst couple words in our life. You ready for this? What if? Does that bother you? Or what if? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but what if? Here's the deal. The world gives us nothing of comfort. Okay, so have I, have I stated the problem well enough? About time to get to an answer. I'm going to go through the entire chapter of John chapter 14. And oh, yeah. this is going to be, uh, and I'm heading for one point at the end. <laughs> I couldn't get there. I could not. The Lord just kept like, no, you need to do this. So we're going to do this. And I'm, this is going to be kind of fun. Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now, we taught that one on the one where we talked about fear. I mean, faith. We're all talking about fear. About faith, okay? It says, do not let your heart be troubled. Who does the work? You. You do. You actually have the power to not let your heart be troubled. <laughs> you believe in God. Believe also in me. Belief, trust, and faith are the same word. Faith and trust. Why is your heart troubled? Because you're not believing. You're not trusting. You're not resting on who he is. Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God. You believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. By the way, the word mansions is only in the King James. And it's a mistranslation of the word. They're not mansions in heaven. I mean, how many songs we used to sing in the, in, the, in the gospel days, you know? Just build my mansion next door to Jesus, you know? No mansions. It means dwelling places. You know what the father really considered to be a joy was to have his son bring his bride home to his house. And that's what the father's doing. He's letting Jesus bring us to his house. What's the mansions? It's just his place. Dwelling places. Who are we going to be dwelling with? With him. I think it'd be absolutely boring to be in heaven and have my own mansion, and Roxy has her own mansion, and finally we get Kimberly out of the house, and she has her own mansion. <laughs> Only in heaven. <laughs> okay, I think that's boring. I want to be around the people that I love, don't you? And in heaven, we don't have any sin to deal with. We'll be with each other in heaven together. How's it going to work? I don't know. I think the majority of our time is going to be at the throne room anyway. And besides that, time will be no more. So how do you even say that? I'm going to spend my eternity. Doesn't sound the same. Okay. In my Father's house, many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Wow. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm coming again and I will receive you to myself. That where I am there, you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Now, this is so cool. He's, he's like, I want you with me. I'm going to go prepare a place and we're going to be together. It's going to be which, just so cool. And then it's the faith and belief in the Father and in the Son together. And this theme is all the way through this. The importance of his presence to go where he is and to be where he is. This is very important. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you go. And how can we know the way? He says, you know where I'm going. You know the way. No, we don't. Thomas is going, no, I don't understand. I do not know. Jesus said to him, well, I'm the way. And I'm the truth. And I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, what did he just show him? Where he's going to the Father and the way through him. He says, no, this is the way it is all working. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now, this is both the relationship and the pathway. You know me, I'm the pathway. And it's by relationship with me and we're going to get there. And you have relationship with the Father. Jesus establishes the truth to our thinking. We've got to get our thinking straight to be in him, and then he establishes the truth in our thinking. And then Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. <laughs> and it is enough for us. And Jesus absolutely, he plays with this poor kid's mind. I don't know how old Andrew was, but he just messes with him. This is so fun. Jesus said to him, am I so a long time with you and you have not known me, Philip? The one seeing me has seen the Father. 
And how do you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words which I speak to you, I do not speak for myself, but the Father who abides in me, he does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. If not, believe me because of the works themselves. Now, this is crazy. This is crazy. He says, he says well, I'm taking you to the Father. And so Philip says, show me the Father. He says, how long have I been with you? Don't you know me? Uh, yeah. He says, seen me, seen the Father. Now, can we say this? Do we have that relationship with the Father in such a way that you can say, seen Lee, seen the Father? This is amazing in the Father and Son relationship. He is talking this way. Now, you notice that clear from the beginning of this chapter, what's he been saying? Father and me, and Father and me, and the Father and me, and the Father and me. It's a Father-Son relationship. The Father and me, the Father and me. And he says, Indeed, I tell you truly, the one believing into me, the works which I do, that one shall also do, and greater than these he will do, because I go to the Father. Now, first of all, everybody's worried about the greater. I'm not worried about the greater. I'm worried about doing the same thing Jesus did. What's the greater? Well, I've heard so many theories and so many discussions on the greater. It's been kind of fascinating. One of the things is that we will do that Jesus has never done. Jesus never led somebody to himself. So if we lead somebody to Jesus, we've done something greater. On the earth, he never led anybody to his own salvation. Yeah, go ahead. Show me the money. <laughs> Are you smoking brain cells? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Another way that he, we do greater is the fact that we are doing things. When Jesus was here, he was limited to being in one place at one time. All we have to do is Jared does something in another section of town that I'm doing here. And what are we doing? Greater? Are we doing things in separate places? We're doing, you know, what's, I'm not worried about the greater. What I'm worried about is healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons, doing miracles raising up disciples, preaching the gospel to the poor. You know, these are the things that Jesus did. Let's do them. But what's it going to take? It says, anyone who believes into me will do what I've been doing. Why? Because what he did was he believed into the Father, and what the Father was doing is what Jesus was doing. The Father and me relationship. Am I losing anybody, or are you all with me? Okay, and then he says that whatever you may ask, because I go to the Father, and whatever you may ask in my name... This I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, as soon as I bring this up, immediately people go, oh, that's not true. I've asked Jesus to do things. And I even said, in Jesus' name, at the end of my prayer, and he didn't do it. Anybody relate to that? Okay. When you pray in his name, you are praying as if you were him. Do you pray the way he prays? Are you praying what he is praying through you? Anything that he is praying through you, he will do. Now, you say, can you verify that? Oh, we just jumped to 1 John chapter 5, or 4, 4 or 5, one of those in there that says that uh, when you pray, if you pray anything according to his will, he hears you. If he hears you, you have the request you ask of him. Okay, so it's praying according to his will. How many times have we prayed and we prayed and we prayed and we never did find out first what God's will was, but we kept speaking the things that we wanted, okay? When we pray the way Jesus prayed, what did the, Jesus do? He spent time in the Father's presence until he knew the will of the Father, so when he prayed, he prayed the will of the Father, and it always happened. Makes sense, right? So the question is, in your praying, how much flesh is there? <laughs> now, he says, and whatever you may ask in my name, this I will do. The Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands. Now, there's the biggie. If you love me, keep my commands. Believing into as Jesus and Father are into. To believe into him. And we're still talking about this, getting into him, getting into him. But the deal is, it's got to be practicality, not theology. And I've discussed this with so many people who had the theology of being in the Father, but the practicality of being in him, 
was totally lost on them. We got this knowledge, and for those of you like, Greg, this is this thing in that chart. <laughs> we aren't feeling it. We aren't living it. We're getting our intellectualism into it, and our theology tells us somewhere, but we aren't learning how to get that to where it's, it's our own emotions that's in it. It's a relationship with father and son. Again, he's going to the father that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And then he says, I will petition the Father and he will give you another comforter that he may remain with you to the age, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him nor know him. But you know him, for he abides with you and shall be in you. And the people who do not believe in a trinity have a real hard time with this chapter. Because this is Jesus talking about the Father and I, and the Father and I, and the Father and I, and I'm going to go and send the Holy Spirit. Well, that kind of like labels them all you know I don't know what you can do with this Uh, this is we are Trinitarians okay we believe in the Trinity he says and I think this is kind of a fascinating deal says but you know him says uh, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him nor know him but you know him for he abides with you and shall be in you at this point the disciples are not born again The indwelling of the Holy Spirit does not come until after the resurrection, and this is before the crucifixion. Okay? Boom! What happens? He's giving them a... He says, the Holy Spirit's going to come and live in you. What a huge thing that he's telling them. How big is that? Okay? That is huge. Another comforter. Another comforter. Now he's talking Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now this is the effect of abiding You'll know him for he abides with you. He abides with you now. See, the Holy Spirit isn't going to be... You can't say that the Holy Spirit wasn't on the planet. He says, but I'm going to go, and then the Father's going to send the Comforter. Well, the Holy Spirit's always been on the planet. He was working in Jesus right there. He was working around. But he's sending the Comforter in a different capacity. If I go to the Father, then he's going to send the Holy Spirit to be in. And that's a whole different capacity. And then we're going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit not till next week and then he says I will not leave you orphans I am coming to you yet a little while the world no longer sees me but you see me because I live you shall also live in that day you shall know that I am in the father and you are in me and I am in you he that has my commandments and keeps them is that one who loves me and the one that loves me shall be loved by my father and I shall love him and will reveal myself to him Go ahead and parse this word, this sentence out. This thing gets really intense, but deep promises of spiritual reality and revelation. And revelation. Now, just, just the idea behind this, and of course, I'm not going to stay, stay here. This is not what I'm trying to do. But do you see this? Because I live, you live. For I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not I, but Christ lives within me. In this life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This whole thing about living a life because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. It's exactly right. And he says, you shall know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, which makes you in the Father, because you're in him as in the Father. But, not just that, but you're also in the Father on your own. But with him, but it's a relationship, but you're in him. But he's in you, and you're in him. And of course, he's in him, and he's in him, and you're in him, and you're in him, and you're in him through him to be there in him, and then him is in you. And when are we going to get it? See, this is, this is beyond, this is way beyond normal brain power to understand. Love is still the major issue, isn't it? He that has my commandments and keeps them, it is that one who loves me. And the one that loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I shall love him and reveal myself to him. It's kind of a fascinating deal. You get revelation of the Father's love as you start building relationship with Jesus. What's Jesus going to do? He's going to take you to the Father. What's the Holy Spirit going to do? Take you to Jesus. What's the Father going to do? Love you. Okay? Then Judas said to him, and I think this is fascinating, and here he says, not the Iscariot Judas, but the other Judas. You know, this is like not baby Anya, but prayer Anya out of Russia, where everybody had the same names. This is not this is not Alexei, this is Alexei, this is the other Alexei. Not you know? Zacharias, but 
Zathras. There you go. Okay. Judah said to him, not the Iscariot, Lord, what has happened that you're about to reveal yourself to us and not at all to the world? I don't know where he got the, aunt, the question, where he got this, where he was thinking. I don't. And he says, what has happened that you're about to reveal yourself to us and not to all the world? And Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and the Father shall love him, and we will come to him and make a dwelling place with him. There's the promise again. The one who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but of the Father who sent me. He, is that an answer to that question? I don't catch it. He kind of ignored it. Okay, but here's the big part. Careful, religion alert. Deep, 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 deep. Warning, warning. Danger, Will Robinson, Danger. Here's what we think when we read this passage. If I do the commands, he will love me. Now, we've heard that all our lives. If you do them, then he'll love you. No, no, no. You've got to understand that the love comes first. Then you'll do. He says, how do I know which one is the one who loves me? The ones who do my commands. Because they do it not because of religion, but they do it because they love me. What's the first thing you need to tell somebody? Yeah, how much God loves them. What's the idea? Is to start building the relationship. People say, does face-to-face ministry work with unbelievers? Yes, absolutely. Only to a degree. What is it that Jesus is going to tell them? I love you. I love you. Man, I've seen this happen so many times. Okay, and God just tells them. The, the, the first one was in the prison there where I ran out of time and I gave the wrong invitation. I said, so who here wants to know Jesus? That wasn't what I was even teaching on. And this guy raised his hand, and I went, ah, I had five minutes before the guards took them out because you don't mess with time in prison. And so I looked at a guy that, that knew Theophostic standing there, and I says, Lloyd, he's yours. And I went back to the other 70 men, and said, I did the invitation the way I wanted to on what we had taught about, about getting the Lord working in their lives in a different way. And so Lloyd went, ah, 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 ah. He, knew, he had no time left. He looked at this guy and says, what do you want? He says, well, I just don't know this Jesus. And he goes, uh, Lord, what do you have to say to this guy? And this guy looked at him. His eyes got wide. He started tearing up. And pretty soon his tears start screaming down his face. He, just, what? he said, well, what did Jesus tell you? He says, he told me he loved me. Heard from God. What is he going to hear? He heard that God loved him. And he wanted to give his sin. And he gave his sin to the Lord. The Lord cha- changed him right there in minutes time and then the guard said okay I opened the doors and ushered everybody out and I'm standing at the door this guy walked up past and just tears still still flowing out of his eyes and he says he saved me he saved me there's one life that one's changed in a moment what did Jesus tell him love then what happened the command started being able to be done and folks don't read your Bible do not read your Bible just to be reading your Bible. Read your Bible because you want to seek Him and you want to love Him and you, you love what He's going to tell you. When you pray to try to gain His favor, that's not prayer the way it works. You know His favor and His love, so what does it make you want to do? Pray. See, why do we do His commands? We do His commands because we love Him. It's not the other way around. We don't do His commands to get His love. Then Jesus says, I have spoken these things to you abiding with you while I'm still here on earth. But the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and remind you of all things that I said to you. Now this is kind of cool. I have spoken these things to you abiding with you, but the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and remind you all things that I said to you. So anybody here need a Comforter? Okay, here's the deal. Remember the first thing we talked about, about the stress? The busy, 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 and the money draw, and all this stuff that you're feeling. What is that? That's somebody who needs a comforter. Yeah. Okay? Now, we're not talking about the kind that's on the blankets and on the bed, the nice, thick comforter. That's not what I'm talking about. Like Jim is thinking about needing a comforter. Okay? <laughs> I did get the pun. I just want to make sure I'm not... But the deal is, is this, do you need a comforter? Well, absolutely. Yeah, how can absolutely. Now, here's the deal. Here's the parakletos. That's the Greek word. It means para, alongside, kaleo, to call. To call someone to come alongside. Now, um, I need help on a regular basis. 
and people are going, boy, do you need help. I know somebody's going to say it, and I know you were thinking it, so that's beside the point. But when I do need help, there are times I can't do a certain job alone. There are certain things I can't do alone. So I call someone who can come alongside who does know how to help. Now, if I'm working on my car, to call Kimberly to come alongside... She's going to be my helper, but not that kind of a helper. I would better know everything about it and tell her what she needs to do. Hand me this. What's that? It's the funny looking thing. Like uh, She doesn't want to know the names of the wrenches and stuff. I don't know. It's just like, it's just, she's not, she's a helper, but that's not that kind of a helper. If I'm looking at my car and I have no idea what's wrong with it, I call Jim. I call somebody who knows what they're, uh, what about this? I call somebody alongside who can help. Okay. When my check engine light comes on, I call Don over at Grand Automotive, okay? There's an advertisement for you right there, okay? This, they knew what they were doing. They figured it out. They put in real parts. It's none of the cheap junk. It's really good stuff. I've been very impressed. What I do? I called on alongside somebody who could do something about it. Now, this is what's really wild, is you have the Holy Spirit living within you. Do you call on him who can do something about it to come help? We need the comforter. Do you remember that he's there? I love to ask this question. It's one of those fun things. Is that I even asked this, this, this last week. When you think of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which one scares you? Now that changes with everybody in the room. Okay? And this gal says, well... Jesus and the Holy Spirit scare me about the same. Really? All these times I've been meeting with her and find out that she's afraid of Jesus and she's afraid of the Holy Spirit. Now, I knew that one. I knew that one. And I said, so it's the Father that gives you comfort? Yeah. Okay. That changed everything. So, Father, what do you have to say to her at this point? It wasn't Jesus. She's afraid of Jesus. You got to understand the religion she grew up in where my religion was just the opposite. We did not know who the Holy Spirit was. And Jesus, well, he was the mediator between God and man because you didn't want to come in the presence of God. He was against you. Closely personal relationship. I know the grammar is not completely perfect there, but it's a closely personal. It's a closely personal relationship. Okay, it's a personal, but it's not just, a, but it's closely personal. That's what I'm trying for here. I wanted to, to get a close personal relationship with the Lord. Okay? We got, that's what we have to get with the Holy Spirit himself. Do we ever talk to him? Holy Spirit, will you? Do we have a relationship with him? Isn't that amazing? Okay. Holy Spirit making Jesus known to us. He's going to come. And then it says this. Finally, that's all introduction. And it says, I leave peace to you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be timid. Now, wait a minute. He started this whole chapter with, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And he comes down here. He says, my peace I leave with you. My peace. Do not let your heart be troubled. Who does the work here? We do. Now, that means that there's something about his peace that I can apply against fear. When my heart is troubled, there's something I can do with it. Do not let your heart be troubled because I give you my peace. I think this is fascinating. There is no turmoil in peace. Now, you think about this. Busy, 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 busy. I got this thing to do. I got this thing to do. Where's the peace? We've got to understand how peace flies. His presence brings his peace. His presence brings his peace. He's there. Why? He's there because he loves you. He's there because he loves you. His presence is there. You have to believe in him and you have to trust him. Now, the reason I brought up peace later in the series is because his presence has got to be known before his peace. If you don't know he's there, there's no peace. If you can't trust him, which is the faith thing, then there's no peace. If you don't know he loves you, there's no peace. Deep, huh? Those three, his presence, faith in him, 
and his love for you are absolutely important. But what comes with it, what's the outcome? It's peace. And I like peace. Now, when I was all addicted to the pornography, there was no peace in my life. None. I couldn't find peace. Peace was not something I... I, (laughs) Peace. But I found out something that the Phineas, when Phineas destroyed the man and the woman and he stabbed them with the javelin and he stopped the plague, what did God say? God said, this is awesome. He spoke for me. He says, tell Phineas that I give him a covenant of peace. And I went, a covenant of peace? And I found out that when I got rid of the pornography in my life, what happened is peace came in. And there came a covenant of peace that comes when the sexual junk is gone. And I'm going, wow, this is really cool. And what has happened is since that time, our house has become a fortress of peace. You know, you can sit in our house and have peace. Peace is a wonderful place. Now, that doesn't mean that you walk in and everybody goes to sleep. Peace does not mean that there's no joy involved. We laugh a lot. We joke around a lot. There's a lot of fun. There's a lot of stuff happening. And, but peace is there. Peace is there. Do not let... It's our choice. Do not let your heart be troubled. Now, I've been playing with this one. <laughs> I don't know. Can you play with Scripture? I seem to do it all the time, but... I've been playing with this, pro- this understanding. When I have turmoil, can I take the peace and actually apply it and make it do something? I have found this. This is kind of a fascinating deal. Jesus sent out the, the disciples two by two out into all the cities of, of Israel. And he says, when you come to a city, okay, you come up to a house you're going to stay in, let your peace go out to that house. Take your peace and throw it onto this house. If there's somebody worthy in that house, your peace will stay. If there's no one worthy, your peace will return to you. Talk about tangible weaponry. Can you take your peace and throw it on somebody? Kind of fascinating. Isn't it amazing? I had this guy come to my church one day when I was at my church in Golden, and I was studying peace how it's a tangible weapon and this guy came in and he was upset because he was not a believer his wife was a believer and she was spending way too much time at church and so he came to talk to the pastor actually he's going to come and straighten me out I saw him get out of his car and he come storming at the door and he had worked himself up into a lather okay he was going to take my situation under hand (laughs) and uh, he came in the door and where's the pastor? And everybody went. You know, all my sheep sacrificed me just slick as grease, man. <laughs> Put it in there. And he turned around and he started walking to me. And I went, and I heard it in the back of my head. Peace is a tangible weapon. Peace is a tangible weapon. And so I went, hi, how are you today? You know, kind of waved at him. But I, I know what I was doing. Whew, I was putting my peace out there. And I went, peace. And I spoke it out. I said, peace, peace. Like this, and walk towards the guy with peace, and like this, and then put my hand out, and he came up, and every step that he took, I gotta do it this way. Every step he took, he went from <clears throat> to, <sighs> um, um, uh, hi, <laughs> hi, how you doing? You know, I'm so and so's husband, and yeah, yeah, she's a wonderful person. She's spending an awful lot of time here, and she's not at home enough. I said, well, tell you what. Let's talk to her about that, and let's work out the schedule and make sure it's... Well, I'm not trying to take her away from you. The idea is that she does enjoy what she does here. Maybe you should come and find out why. Have you ever come in and sat and figured out what it is that she sees and why she's here? I said, it's very peaceful. He says, yeah, I see that. <laughs> I was... So, you can, you can let this stuff work for you, okay? So, okay, Miranda. You know, I work so much, and I never get appreciated for it, and then I feel like I don't get paid for it, and then all of a sudden I'm working so much that 
I feel like I'm working two jobs and then I'm not getting paid for it and then I can't make my bills and then all of a sudden I'm really, really stressed. And then I saw I watch my TV show so that I won't get de-stressed and then all of a sudden I can't get jail and then all of a sudden Tim's like freaking out because he lost his hedge fund and then what do we I do? I bless you with peace. <laughs> now. <laughs> A little, a little peace goes a long way, isn't it? And then all of a sudden, I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, I feel good. Have a little peace and joy. And then I start losing my everything. And whew, hallelujah. <laughs> peace works the same way. It is kind of an amazing deal that you can take peace and put it on your situation. Do not let your heart be troubled. This may be my heart. You know what I can do with my heart? Shut up. Heart. Yeah, but, but I got this. I'm this but I don't go this. Shut up. Pfft. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Do not let your heart be troubled. My peace, I give you. And then my Corvette isn't worth it. Yeah. Okay. You're blessed with peace. Go away. <laughs> peace is tangible. It says this. Now, this is, this is the last of the chapter. I just wanted you to see it. It says, You heard that I said to you, I'm going away, and I'm coming again to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced that I said I'm going to the Father. For my Father is greater than I. Anytime you want to discuss this with me, I'll let you. The Father is greater than Jesus. In what way? How? How do you want to do this? How do you want to do this? This is a fun discussion. Okay. And now I have told you before it occurs that when it occur you may believe. I shall no longer speak many things with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. But that, that the world may know that I love the Father, even as the Father commanded me, so I do. What is the commandments there for? To prove that the love is already established. Mm -hmm. That the world may know. In other words, they're going to be able to see this in your outward expressions. And then he says, come on, let's go. Where's he going? To Gethsemane. Come on, let's go. This should be our attitude. Uh, the, the enemy's coming, but he has no hold on me. Pfft. Yeah. But that the world may know, I'm going to do the things that God has told me to do because I love him. Fear versus peace. Our fear puts us in turmoil. We're overwhelmed with it. We feel alone. You know, this whole thing about needing to know stuff, being responsible for stuff that I can't not know. Well, wait a minute. That's only if you're alone. If I'm with somebody who does know, it's not a problem. You know, when you're in an airplane, flying along, a little private aircraft, and the pilot dies of a heart attack, it's about time you figure out who else in the aircraft has any pilot experience. It could make a lot of difference right there, huh? But it's amazing. If you're alone, there's turmoil. If you're not alone and there's somebody there and knows about it, you're not in turmoil. Kind of a big deal. Isn't it fun? And yet, responsible for everything. We feel we're alone and yet we're responsible for everything. His presence brings peace. His presence brings peace. It's something about, well, I got this, this, oh, this, this. I should stop for a second. Lord, Boom! What are we doing? Practicing his presence. What are we doing? Bringing him involved in this thing. Lord, I'm in turmoil. I don't want to let my heart be troubled. Why? Because you gave me your peace. Lord, there's got to be a way of dealing with this thing. We are in his hands and we can rest. How cool is that? We have his peace. My peace I give you. We need to listen to his spirit in us. We need to listen to his spirit in us. Am I making sense? Okay. John 16, says this, I have spoken these things to you that you may have peace in me. You have distress in this world, but be encouraged. I have overcome the world. Look at these words. Peace is in him. Now that word distress is one of the funnest words to speak in the whole Greek language. Anybody remember it? As soon as I say this, you're going to, I'll do it for you. You don't have to kick yourself. Philipsis. Oh. Distress. Philipsis. <laughs> Someone says, can you say that? I don't know if you can say that without lifting. Philipsis. <laughs> but you can't have the th, th on the F on the end because then the philipsis doesn't sound right. It makes you spit on people. Thank you. 
overcome. You have distress in this world. By the way, that word distress actually means pressure. In this, you have pressure in this world. You have stress. You have pressure in this world. Anybody relate to that one? And he says, but be encouraged. I have overcome the world. The overcome is the word Nike. Or Nike. Nike is what they got right out of Strong's Concordance. Okay? Nike is the way it's really pronounced. And it means conquering, victory, so to subdue, to win. I love it. Nike. The world is where our turmoil comes from. Have you noticed that? <laughs> well, then why are we still living in the world as if we are of the world? You're in it, but you're not of it. You're now, you have greater capacity. Why? Because you're in a whole different realm, a spirit realm. Okay? Now, Isaiah 26, 3 says this, You will keep in perfect peace the mind stayed on you, for he trusts in you. Isn't that a fascinating word? You will keep him in perfect peace. Now, what is kind of fascinating about perfect? You look up the word perfect, and it's the word shalom. You look up the word peace, and it's the word shalom. So what it is, it is peace, peace. It's shalom, shalom. It is peace squared. Yeah, that's about it. It's, it's when it's doubled like that, means it is powered. It is a powered thing. I, you keep him in perfect peace. Peace, peace, the total peace. Whose mind... The mind is everything framed by the mind, everything formed by the mind, every thought, every kind of attitude, everything. It says the mind, okay, every mind thought, it's the uh, yet sir, if you want to really know it. Yes, sir. Yet, sir. Okay. Stayed on you means to establish or propped onto, propped up. It says you will keep him in perfect peace, the mind that is established. The thought process that are established on him because you trust in him. Well, I'm just break this apart. Every area where your mind is not stayed on him gets how much peace? Zip, not a goose egg, nothing. Okay, that's the that. This is the great Nietzsche vote. Okay, this is the great nothing. The old and bullshit Nietzsche vote. This is it. Okay. Nothing. You get nothing if your mind is not stuck on him. To trust and faith are relational, for he trusts in you. Again, right back to the faith and the presence. How's this working? Romans 8, 6 says this, For the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit is life and... How cool is that? Mind, life and peace. The Greek word for mind there is a Greek word phroneo. It means the thought processes of the flesh, the way the flesh thinks will produce death. The way the spirit thinks will produce life and peace. So where are you putting your thoughts? <laughs> Why is that working out for us? Okay, we know this. Are we making it functional? There's forensic evidence. Now, Rick was talking this morning about he's an empirical kind of guy. He has to have evidence. But me too. <laughs> Okay, But it's very simple to look at a person's life and you can look at anybody's life and you can tell immediately, almost immediately, their levels of peace. Therefore, you can tell almost immediately their levels of relationship with God. Okay, You can tell that the mind of the flesh is killing them. The way of thinking is the wrong way. It's not hard to look at, folks. And people think, wow, you're so discerning and you're so... Boy, the Holy Spirit just, well, okay, that's all true. But the reality of it is, it's not hard to see. Anybody can see it if you're looking for it. That's like saying, anybody seen a cap that looks just like this one? Oh, there it is. It's not real hard. You know, it's obvious. It's right there. Turmoil, on the other hand, is absolutely and totally deadly, isn't it? The mind of the flesh is death. Our turmoil, how's that working out for our marriages? Anybody here like peace? I like peace. Man, I look at the difference between pre-peace and post-peace. <laughs> I like post-peace a lot better than pre-peace in my marriage. I like it after the peace showed up. My marriage is completely different. Life and peace are healthy. I like that part. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, And may the God of peace himself, which means, that's amazing because that's his name, fully sanctify you. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, this is kind of a fascinating deal. Peace in your spirit 
Well, that's not hard to do because now we're born again completely in our spirit, right? However, peace in our soul, ay ay, that's a little lacking. And because of that, how's the peace in our bodies? Do you know that stress is the number one leading killer in our country? Why? What does it bring? Oh, just about everything. All kinds of disease. Cancer, heart failure, <laughs> your cholesterol levels, how's that doing? You know, Archibald Hart, Dr. Archibald Hart says, it's simple. You can't control your, your cholesterol through diet because you, you only get about 5% of your cholesterol through your diet. The rest of it's made by your own body under stress. He says, so you want to control your cholesterol levels? Control your stress levels. So in other words, what we're doing here is, is like having a health food restaurant. You know, this is it, man. We're, this is, we're just having lives here. Okay. Sanctified. And may the God of peace himself fully sanctify you. What does sanctified mean? Set aside for God's use only. So here's what kind of fascinating. The God of peace wants to sanctify your spirit in peace. He wants to sanctify your soul into peace, set aside for his use only. And he wants to sanctify your body in peace, set aside for his use only. He wants to use you, and when you use you for you, that's where stress happens. When you use you for him, you don't. You say, then why do people burn out in ministry? They forget the reason they're doing it. They aren't doing it out of love for him anymore. They're doing it for another reason. And of course, this one, and I'll do it quickly because I do it, it seems like every week. Philippians 4, 6 through 7, be anxious about nothing but in everything by prayer, by petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Take it to him. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God. Well, this is wild. Peace from the God of peace. What do we do with it? We got, it's beyond our understanding. It's beyond what we're thinking. It's, it surpasses all our understanding. It's not what our head thinks. It's beyond that. But it guards our hearts and our minds. I like the idea of having my heart and my mind guarded. Do not let your heart be troubled. My heart is guarded. Because I did what? Here's the situation. You give the turmoil to him. You give the turmoil to him. Are we stopping to pray? Just like what Rick was saying today during the offertory. Are we stopping to pray about it? You say, pray, pray about what? It's not big enough to pray about. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> what do we not bring into his presence? Those are things that bring turmoil. We've got to have his presence around us. So it really boils down to so many of the things of just being in him. Therefore, as elect ones of God, holy and beloved. Now, this is the passage that talks about putting off the old man and putting on the new man. Okay? And it goes on, it says, Therefore, as elect ones of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassions. We're supposed to put on compassions, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. We need to put on bearing with one another and we put on forgiving yourselves if anyone has a complaint against any, even as Christ forgave you. How did he do that? He did that very well, thank you. So also you should forgive. Above all these love which he's talking about putting on. It's the same, same sentence structure. And above all these, put on a garment of love, which is the bond of perfectness. Teleo, uh, maturity, the bond of end result. Put on this garment of love. This is kind of a fascinating deal. We've been talking about taking off all these garments. He's got a garment of defilement, a garment of all these things, taking off these defilement. But he's talking about literally putting on a garment of love. So that when I have this garment of love, I walk up to somebody, they see the love first. They see the love before they see the flesh. That's a garment of love. And above all these, put on love, which is the bond of maturity. And let the peace of God rule in your heart. Now, who does the work here? And you, let the peace of God rule in your heart, to which you are also called in one body and be thankful. Let it rule. Let it in. We've got to let it in. It makes sense. Putting on an identity unto love, letting the peace of God rule in our hearts. Am I making sense? Okay. Peace versus fear. He is the prince of peace. And that's crazy. Peace has authority. The prince of peace. If somebody's a prince of somewhere, he has the authority of that place. The Prince of England has the authority of England. 
the Prince of Peace has the authority of peace. <laughs> However, it can be replaced. I can submit to another prince. We look for peace we can control. I want to be able to use the peace my own way, my own peace. No, this is God's peace. It's going to have to be done his way. That's all there is to it. Addictions come from replacing peace. Yeah, think about this. Why do people smoke? And I, I, why do I bring up smoking? Is because it's such a, a common thing. Why do people smoke? It gives them peace. It's a false peace. It doesn't last. What does it do? It calms you down. Therefore, under any kind of a stressful situation, what do people want to do? First thing they do, light up a cigarette. Why? They're trying to bring peace to an area of turmoil. What does the cigarette do? The cigarette has replaced the Prince of Peace. And you say, well, them nasty old smokers. I mean, that shows their problem. Oh, boy, don't go there. We all have certain things that bring us peace. It can be alcohol. It can be drugs. Yeah, that's all true. But it can even be TV. Lose myself in a movie so I can think. I just don't have to worry about all the other stuff. Food. Oh, there's nothing like a great, big, nice, cream-filled donut that just, boy, there's comfort for you, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. It can be anything. But if it's something that we're using on the external to bring us peace instead of the relationship we have with him, it's replacing him and it will backfire. It doesn't fulfill, so we look for more of it. There's a law of diminished returns. And that's why people smoke more cigarettes and more and more and joints and this, and it goes long to heroin, to crack, to whatever. Folks, it's just, what is it? It's a law of diminished returns. The number one reason guys get into pornography, you ready for this, is because of stress relief. The number one reason. It's because I can get my fantasy, and this world has no nagging, has no problems, everything's paid for. I can lose myself in a fantasy. What is it? It's replacing the Prince of Peace. And it has diminished returns. It needs more and more and more. We cannot replace his presence. We just can't. It just it won't work. We have to acknowledge the fear that we have. Denial is what's killing us. The denial that we're not afraid. Well, I'm not afraid. No, it's the denial that's killing us, keeping the fear working in our lives. We have to confront it when it comes. We have to know it's there. We have to find what it is that we truly fear. You know, and it's not just the obvious like spiders. It's not just the obvious. It's the unobvious ones we've got to find. We've got to know what it is that scares us. We've got to know what it is. And that's what we've got to take to the Lord. What is the message we are receiving Okay, I'll never get out of debt. That's fear. The message we're receiving is, I can't do it. I'm inadequate. And I'm the one I have to trust in, so I'm done. I'm toast. And the fear consumes us. Take that thought captive into Jesus. What is it that's consuming? What is the thought? That's what you have to take to him. Lord, will I ever get out of debt? Is that a simple answer? Or a simple question? What's the answer? Oh, you're going to have to wait. You have to hear from him. I'm not your Lord. He is. Okay, Lord, what do I do about this? No fear. You've got to get rid of the fear. What does Jesus say about it? Or if you're fairy to Jesus, what does the Holy Spirit say about it? Or if you don't like the Holy Spirit, what does the Father say about it? But you're going to have to. That's the only three you got, okay? That's all there is. What are we allowing to reign in our lives? What are we allowing to reign? Do not let your heart be troubled, but let peace reign. Is all stuff we have to do. It's all stuff we're doing. So again, we're right back at, are you practically applying what we're learning? Are you looking for the fear? Do you know how to deal with that fear? What's the deal? The first thing you do is find the presence of Jesus. Jesus is right with you. What does he have to say about it? Apply the trust. Apply these things in your life. What are you going to have to do? Die to that death and do what? Submit to him. Let his peace reign. So what is your turmoil factor? On a scale from 1 to 10, no. <laughs> I got people in this room that would tell me it was 9 or 10. How much strife is there in your life? How much strife is there? Strife is just fear. 
Strife is just fear. It's relational fear. How much strife is there? So, let me ask you a question. What is there to fear? See, it's a different answer for everybody in the room. What is there to fear? What is there to fear? You can't fear the government. You can't fear the economy. You can't fear... He says, why? Everybody else is. Well, let them. That's why they're having heart attacks and cancer and everything else. Why don't we trust in the Lord? He's bigger than governments. He's bigger than all this stuff. Peace would be much better. Wouldn't peace be better? Well, how about this? Bring your fear under the hand of the Prince of Peace. It's time to bring it. It's by relationship. Does that make sense this morning? I knew that this, was a, this one is a barn burner. Why? I've got to have peace. Got to have peace. Right in the middle of the turmoil, there's got to be peace. Now, what I'm trying to do, what I'm really learning how to do, is the people that sit in front of me when we're doing our face-to-face understanding is how do I deal with their fear? The Lord's got to bring it up. And boy, when he stirs up their fear, then we get to deal with it. Are we learning? Do we need to apply this? Big time. Big time. Okay. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for what you're doing in our lives today. Lord, you are the mighty God we serve. We love you so, so deeply. Thank you, Lord, that we can come to you with our deep fears. You don't throw us away. You don't condemn us. You don't kick us out. You don't say to us. You just love us. And Lord, you are there to bring peace to our hearts. And Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you that you love me so much that you will deal with my turmoil. I give you praise for all of this, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.